Thanks for watching CMTV. We know you'll be blessed by this week's message. Be sure to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. Visit cmjacksboro.com for more information about our church and ways you can get involved. Thanks for joining us and welcome home. Good morning. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I've had to close my eyes standing up here on Sunday mornings. One reason is because they brighten the lights on me. But the other reason is because it, it's, it's hard to look into a, a, an empty auditorium and, and not see you there. But it, as you're listening here in the worship center this morning, if you're sitting at home this morning, if you're listening on radio or however you're listening, we are so thankful for you being here. We're so thankful that you listen. I believe that God is speaking like never before. I believe he's given us a message. I believe he's given us a mandate, and I believe he's sent us on a mission. And, and we're going to continue to do those things, and we're going to try to continue to equip each and every one of you for the work of ministry. That's what God has, has called us and appointed us for to, and anointed us to equip each and every one of his sons and daughters for the work of ministry. He said to go in all the world and preach the gospel to every being. And, and so as we do that, that's not about just me going ever. It's about you and and I both going everywhere we go. You're his representative. One of the main words that I gave you in, back in, in the 1st of January, I, I've shared with all of you that listen to me that God began to be pouring words out upon me. I began to have dreams and seeing things. And, and as I began to do that, one of the biggest words that God gave me was restoration. And when he gave me the word restoration, it was something that really touched my heart because it's something that I believe that God spoke to me many, many years ago. And it's something that is very important for the body of Christ. Because if you study throughout the Word, He tells us that until the restoration of all things take place, Christ will not return. And I believe that He's preparing us for His return. I believe that's a part of what the realignment is that's taking place. I believe there's a reassignments taking place, that God is placing new assignments on each and every one of us. I believe that He's doing some things that is above and beyond anything we can ever hope, dream, imagine, anything we can even think up. And, and so I want to encourage you, don't give in, don't give up. We're going to go through this. We're going to go to the other side. God will have the victory in and through all of this virus, all that's taking place. And, and so as we look at the word restoration, one of the most important things that I told you for this year would be the covenant. We have an Abrahamic covenant that God told Abraham. He said, you're going to be the father of many nations. And Abraham, you know, how's that going to take place? I, I'm an old man and I haven't had children. My wife is, is barren and hasn't had a child. And so they decide to help God out. And you know the story that, that they sent in the handmaid and, and he had relations with her and they had a son that was named Ishmael. And he said, God, this is the blessing. This is the, the one that you're going to use to build these mighty nations. And he said, well, he will have several kings and, and things under him, but he said, no, he's not the son of promise. He said, you're going to have the son of promise. And, and that son of promise is about covenant. It's about relationship with God and man. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth and he created Adam, he, he formed Eve out of the rib of, of, of Adam, and God gave them instructions. And he told them that you are to tend to the garden. You're to take care of it. So he created mankind for relationship. He created mankind for rulership. And that's what he, he wanted for us. He created us in the image of God. He created male and female. And so he created us to have the image of God and to represent that image of God. He created man for intimacy with God. When the serpent came in the garden and he deceived Eve and she took of the fruit and her husband was standing there with him. God had given him the authority. That authority had not changed. But he made a choice to heed to the voice of someone other than God. And they ate of the fruit. And so in that moment, it changed that image of God. And it became a selfish image. It became a self-fulfillment image. It came about looking at themselves. Why do you think they ran and hide? Because they realized they were naked. So it became about self. It was no longer focused on intimacy with God. It was no longer focused on the image of God, but it was focused on me. What about me? 
What about mine? Okay, so God has to set a plan into motion because of that sin. Satan usurped the authority. Satan took the authority that God had given to mankind. So we fast forward thousands of years and he sent his son and he came. He lived that perfect life. And he died upon the cross for every sin, past, present, and future. He became sin. And so as he died and then three days later he arose, what he did was he defeated death, the grave, he defeated sin, sickness, disease. He defeated the devil himself. He won a victory for you and I. And when he said in Matthew 28, he says, All authority has been given unto me, now you go. What he just said was, I've taken the authority back from the devil that he sowed from mankind. We're going back to the image of God. We're going back to the intimacy with God. You're going to go back and you're going to rule. You're going to reign in this lifetime to now. And you are going to have relationship with God. And you're going to have relationship with one another. In Proverbs 18.1, he says, A man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. And he goes against all sound wisdom. We have been told that we have to isolate. We have been told that we have to separate. We have been told that we have to quarantine. And all of those things. It is out of the pits of hell. It is not the intention of the Father. Is there a time that you go to a quiet place? Is there a time that you go and get away? Yes, there is. Because Jesus went away to a quiet place. But when he went to that quiet place, he was going to have fellowship with the Father, to have that intimacy with the Father. The, the terroristic assault, in my opinion, of the COVID-19, the Wuhan virus, Chinese virus, whatever it is, however it was created, however it was formed, it was a terroristic attack from the pits of hell to cause separation between God's sons and daughters. To make you isolate yourself, and when he isolates, when you isolate yourself, you begin to wring your hands and says, Oh my God, what is gonna happen? Oh my God, where are my children, my grandchildren? Oh my God. It brings about fear. God says we must walk in faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Fear is the substance of things dreaded, the evidence of things not seen. God created you and I to rule and reign. We should have been ruling and reigning and stopping this virus because all power and authority has been given to who? Us. And what did he say? Go into all the world. Go into all the world. Raise the dead, heal the sick, cast out demons, Wuhan virus, get the hell out of here. How about that? That's where it came from, you understand? God is bringing back intimacy to His sons and daughters. There is a restoration that has taken place. The devil meant it by, for harm, but God is raising up a mighty military might of His sons and His daughters that are not going to be moved by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Not by bite nor power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So we must learn to be led by the Spirit of God. We must hear what the Spirit of God says, and then we must obey what He says. Jesus said, I only go where the Father tells me to go. I only say what the Father tells me to say. And so we've got to come back to that place where we are seeking Him first, not last. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all other things will be added upon you. You need toilet paper? <laughs> I'm sorry, y'all. I told y'all, a lot of stuff goes through my head. <laughs> oh. God is restoring. He's about restoring. God wants to restore His church to a place that it's never been before. Because see, when you look, the word restore in Mr. Webster's dictionary, it means to bring back to a former or an original state or condition. God is not about restoring to an original state, 
or origin, an or original condition, what God is about, when you study the Bible and you, you research about restoration, and when you begin to read about restoration, you will read that things are better than they were before. If you stole a lamb in the Old Testament days and you were caught, you had to return it four times that. Whenever you stole an oxen or an ox, you had to return five oxen. In the book of Job, when Job lost everything that he had, the Bible says at the end Job was two times more wealthy than he was before. Restoration in the Bible is always bigger than you can understand, you can imagine, you can think up, you can hope for. Because it is exceedingly, abundantly, above and beyond. Because we have a Father that sees things different than you and I see it. He sees a clear picture of it. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And so He is about right now bringing about some restoration. Today He allowed a return to begin to come back to the buildings. He began to allow us to, to get out of that isolation, to get away from that loneliness, to get away from all of that fear. Why? Because God created you for fellowship. He created you for intimacy. He doesn't want you to be separated. That's why he tells a husband and a wife, he said, you may separate for a time to make sacrifices before the Lord, to seek the Lord. But you don't continually stay separated. You've got to come back together because you've got to have that intimacy. God created you to have intimacy with one another. It is called community. We're going to take communion here. We are communing together. We are living together. We are coming together. He said, if you take your parts and I take my parts and we put it all together, we see a bigger picture of Christ. That's why he says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. That means you take your gifts, your callings, your talents. I take my gifts, my callings. Everybody around takes all of them. We put them all together and all of a sudden we accomplish more. Because see, if one can send a thousand to fight, two can send ten thousand. How many can ten thousand send to fight? There is a returning to God. And there is a restoration that is going to take place of the covenant of God. That we're going to realize that there is a covenant that God made with Abraham. At 86 years old, he had a baby called Ishmael. But when he was 100 years old, and Sarah was 99 years old, Isaac was born. That was the son of promise. And that covenant has never changed. He said, I'll be your God, and you'll be my sons and daughters. That has not changed, and so the restoration of the covenant must come about. We've got to begin to recognize some things. We've got to recognize why God formed us, why He fashioned us in our mother's wombs. If He knew us before He formed us, why did He form us? There was no accidents because He said He knew you. He called you, He appointed you, He anointed you, He assigned you. He gave you a mandate, a mission, and He gave you a message. It's about Jesus and Him crucified. We've got to give out away from that self-image of looking at self and put our eyes back upon God and see that we are created in His image for His purpose. His purpose for you and I was to take on that image in all of the world. When I study and I look at things and I see what the Father is doing, everything and everywhere I look today, God is saying, it's about my heart, it's about my heart. I want you to express my heart. I want you to express my heart to my people. In turn, I want my people to express my heart to a lost world, to a hurting world. What does God want to restore? He wants to restore your health. He wants to restore your, your families. He wants to restore your faith. He wants to restore. But all of it is going to be better than it ever was before. Because you're going to begin to be restored in the image that you were created in and for. You're going to be restored to that intimacy. See, when Moses spoke, the people spoke to him because they didn't want intimacy with God. Because they were afraid of God. God said it's time for our sons and daughters to enter into the promises of God. 
The promises of God are yes and amen. We are to walk in and on the promises of God. The promise of the Holy Spirit was given on the day of Pentecost. When the Holy Spirit came, His tongues of fire and landed upon the people and they began to speak with other tongues. They began to move with a power they had never experienced before. That was the beginning. And 3,000 men got saved in one day, not counting the women and the children. He says in the latter days they're going to be greater than those early days. The church must return with a power that has never been seen before. The only way that that is going to take place is if we get rid of the selfish image and begin to operate in the image of whom and, and why we were created. We've got to return to that intimacy. And as we return to that in intimacy, we're going to begin to hear the Father like never before. He is speaking to each and every one of you. And He's saying, I am waiting for you. I need you. I want you. Sadie and I experienced this year the birth of our first grandchild. Lynn and Yancey experienced the birth of their first grandchild. You know, when you have that first grandchild, I, I, it, it's beyond my comprehension. It is beyond my understanding. I loved my children so much that I would lay down for them. But when you walk into a room and that baby does not know you're anywhere in the room and his mother is holding him, and when you begin to speak across the room and he nearly jumps out of his mother's arms trying to find that voice. He's looking everywhere he can. He's trying to find that voice. When you experience that and you hear the Father say, that is me. That is me. I want you to understand when you call unto me, I am looking for you. I want you to understand. I love you so much. I want you to hear my voice. I want you to look for my voice the same way that baby looks for yours. You understand? That is a, how can God do that? Because He's God and you ain't. He is speaking to you. Look around. Open your eyes. Open your ears. He who has ears to hear, let Him hear. Father, give us ears to hear. We want to hear. Are you at that place where you're willing to get rid of all of the junk, to release all of that junk so you can operate as the body of Christ? We cannot return to same old, same old. The church of the living God cannot return to where it has been. It has been anemic, it has been powerless. It has not spread the gospel in all the world. We have been building our own ministries. We have been building our own churches. We have been building our own kingdom. It is about the Father and His kingdom. He said the message of the kingdom will be preached throughout the world. The message of the kingdom is returning to that God image that He created you in. Returning to that intimacy with God that He created you for. It's about hearing His voice and obeying what He tells you to do. You walk as Jesus walked. You talk as Jesus talked. Do I have any scriptures to back all of this up? Do I have some scriptures? If you want to go back to the Old Testament and you want to see some things that God said, if you read in the book of Amos, you read some of the modern prophets, God spoke in a way that they could not deny. And God said, I'm sick of your sin. Because you don't mean any of it. You're just mouthing the words. You're a cloud without any rain in it. Read some of it. Read in Amos. And you read what he says. He says, I am tired of your, I despise your ritualistic worship and empty sacrifice. The sacrifices of God are a broken and contrite heart. It is about recognizing. It isn't about me. It is about Him. And I've got to be willing to say, Create in me a clean heart, O God. 
Take not your spirit from me. You think about the heart and what all God is saying. He says, I despise your lip service. I despise your devotion. I am sick of your singing. Read it. It's in Amos 5, 21 and 22. You think maybe God is sick of us singing things about when we get up there? We're supposed to be singing about what we're supposed to do here. It's going to be great when we get up there. Why worry about what's going on up there? Worry about bringing what's going on up there to here. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Quit thinking and worrying about the rapture. You're going to be out of here, so don't worry about it. You're not going to see it coming. In Luke 13, he said, Do business till I return. Occupy till I return. We've got to get about the Father's business. The Father's business is about representing His image here and on this earth. The Father's business is about representing God's intimacy here on this earth. God is sick of the divisions that we have made because we have taken minor details. We have stopped focusing on the major, which is Jesus Christ and Him crucified, forgetting all things which lie behind, but pressing on for why He's taken hold of me. That's why the Apostle Paul came to the place that he said, I don't want to know anything. He said, Christ and Him crucified. I want to know what all He did, what all it, it, it took place, and, and how I am supposed to represent that here on this earth. It's about the heart, y'all. It's always about the heart. And it's about the Father's heart. It's about you and I representing the Father's heart. Are you representing the Father's heart? Husbands, are you representing the Father's heart with your wives? Wives, are you representing the Father's heart with your husbands? Moms and dads, are you representing the Father's heart with your children? The Father loves them unconditionally. Are you loving them unconditionally? And I want you all to understand. I found the scripture that said, beat that child with a rod and drive rebellion far from him. And you can do that without causing physical harm. You can do that because God says He despises His Son when He refuses to discipline Him, when He refuses to correct Him. There is a correction that has taken place. There is a restructuring that has taken place in the way we've always done things. God says we've got to begin to recognize His covenant. We've got to begin to restore that covenant. 400 years ago in the United States of America, they made a Mayflower Compact. And in that Mayflower Compact, they said we have an explicit covenant with Almighty God. It's been 400 years and God is speaking again and said, y'all have got to return to that covenant. I'm going to restore that covenant. In and through all of this isolation, in and through all this quiet time that we've had, God is saying, each and every one of you, need to deal with some things in your lives. Are you offering words to the Father with nothing in them? Are you a whitewashed tomb, as He called the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Are you a cloud without any refreshing rain? Several years ago, I was training horses and bulldogging, doing everything I could do, working and welding and and. I was out at the horse barn one day working with a horse and, and God began to speak to me. And the thing that I heard Him say is I'm granting repentance. I'm granting reconciliation and I'm granting restoration. Well, instantly I thought about 1 Timothy 2.25. God says, if we're a servant Lord must be gentle to all, correcting those who are in opposition. Be patient. If perhaps God grant them repentance that they may know the truth and come to their sentences and escape the snare of the evil one. And as I began to look at it, I began to think about that. I said, Father, you're granting repentance because you said it's your will for none to perish but all to come to the full saving knowledge of the Lord. Father, you said in Acts 
that we should repent that times of refreshing may come. Because when we repent, those times of refreshing begin to come upon us because we get all, rid of all that guilt, that shame, that condemnation. We get rid of all that legalist junk within us. I'm granting repentance, reconciliation, restoration. Well, okay, God, in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and 18, you said that you are reconciling the world to yourself and you're giving each and every one of your sons and daughters that ministry of reconciliation. Okay, so we've got that reconciliation. You're granting repentance. You're, you're, you're bringing about reconciliation. And Father, you said in the Bible, when you restore something, it's better than it ever was before. Father, you said in Acts that you are going to restore all things and then Christ would return. So, Father, I, I know that you're speaking this. And what do I do with this? He told me to call a minister friend of mine. I called him and I said, hey, God's been really dealing with me, really speaking to me. And he said that he's granted repentance, reconciliation, and restoration for the body of Christ. And he wants us to repent. He wants us to be reconciled to him, to his image. He wants us to be restored to where we're bigger and better than ever before in the church of the living God. Walking as he walked, talking as he talked. And he said, Man, that is awesome, Eugene. That is the Lord. And he said, hey, uh, I'm going to a, a conference in a, in a few days. Will you be willing to go with me? I believe that you've got to present that word. Well, when I went to that meeting, I was the only 30-year-old in the room. And they had different speakers, and they began to speak. And the very first speaker spoke on repentance, that it's good to repent. Because when you repent, it brings about a refreshing. It's good to repent. Because the Father said when we recognize and repent of what we are doing, then it brings about the Father cleansing all unrighteousness away from us, and then we have fellowship with one another. So it's good to repent. Then the next speaker got up, and he talked about reconciliation. That God says He's given us the ministry of reconciliation. That He came to reconcile the world to Himself. That's why He died and came for us to reconcile us back to God because of that separation. Well, He broke for a meal and, and that friend of mine walked over to me and he said, how about that? He said, they've just taught on the first two that you told me about. He said, I'm going to ask them to let you share on the third one. Well, the third one is restoration. But you understand the first two have to take place before you can have the third one. And he made an, an announcement in the middle of the meeting as we were beginning again, and he said, hey, I believe God's got something that Eugene needs to share with us. And the leader of the meeting says, does it have anything to do with what we're doing? And a friend of mine said, well, yes, it, it does. And he said, well, all right, you can, you can take a few minutes. And I shared about restoration. I shared about the vision. I shared about what God spoke to me, that he was granting repentance, reconciliation, and restoration. And I said, I'm a young man sitting here before you, and I came here to learn from you. I came here to hear what God is saying. But the first message was about repentance. The second one was about reconciliation. And the third message is about restoration. I have yet to see anybody repent. God is calling you preachers. Repent. You have been preaching a gospel other than Christ and Him crucified. You have been preaching a gospel other than the kingdom of God in your presence. The kingdom of God inside. You have been preaching another gospel. It is not about the sons and daughters of being the church. It's about making pew setters, chair setters. It's not about going in all the world and you do the work. It's about coming and listening to me. And look how many members I have. Look what I am doing. That is not the image of the Father. The image of the Father is always point to Him. The image of the Father is to walk in humility. Taking none of the glory upon yourself. Because it's about Him and not you. How do y'all like that one? Ain't that good? Amen. I mean, yeah, I got a whole lot of amens, a whole lot of, yeah. Can you imagine what 
the preachers are doing and listening to this, they better be repenting. And I said, I have yet to see anyone call for repentance. I have yet to see anybody acknowledge that we haven't been doing it God's way. I was not very popular in that meeting, you know. I took a pretty good lashing. I did it in respect. I did it in honor. I said, I don't understand. When I go before a preacher and I, I start praying for him, and he said, man, you pray about everything. Well, don't you? Man, you just pray all the time. You just pray about anything and everything. Well, don't you? I discovered in that meeting that there has to be a recognition of your sin before you can ever repent. And to recognize your sin, you cannot resist the instrument that God sent to you. You know what I tell my wife when she comes to me and tells me what I'm doing? Don't you be preaching to me. I'm the preacher. I don't really, y'all. At one time I did. But I don't anymore. Because I immediately say, Father, I need to hear what you're saying. Grant me repentance to know the truth. I need to know what you're saying. I need to know what you're saying. You've got to have a recognition of the need to report. And you've got to recognize the messenger that was sent to you. They may do it in a way that's very harsh, that's very critical, that's very condemning. King David's son Absalom stowed the kingdom away from him. He talked to people into following him instead of following his daddy. He said, well, if I was a king, I'd do this and I'd do that. If I was a king, well, we need you to be king because you're going to give us everything we want because we have a self-image. We look at ourselves. It's about us. It's not about the father. And so they begin to follow Absalom. And so they kick David out of town. He's leaving Jerusalem and his right-hand men are all walking out with him. And these are mighty men that have come. They have done some amazing things. They have conquered kingdoms. And the man that's walking beside him is the baddest of the bad. And the man begins to throw rocks at King David and mocked him, making fun of him. And says, you dog, you. And David's right-hand man pulls his sword out and said, David, let me go kill him. Let me go kill him. I'm going to cut his head off, David. And David said, no. God sent him here. And I need to hear what he has to say. And David repented. David is the one that wrote Psalms 51 that says, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Take not your spirit from me. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Then I will teach transgressors your way. I will teach them about you, Father. David was a man after God's own heart. And you read some of the stories about David. He was not a very good guy. He was not a very nice guy. He did some evil things. But when he was confronted with his sins, he fell on his face and he said, God, it's me. It's me, Father. I've sinned against heaven and against you because I've sinned against your sons and daughters created in your image. We've got to recognize that the instrument that is sent to you, they may do it in a harsh way. They may tell you to grow up. They may tell you're having a pity party. They may come in a package pack like me. But you've got to be willing to recognize when the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. Because the only messenger that there can be is the Holy Spirit of God. Because He said, I'll guide you into all truth. David recognized in and through that man that God was speaking to him. And David repented. And his... His son Absalom was killed. David and his men returned back to Jerusalem as they walked into town. Guess who met them? The man that was throwing rocks at David and cursing him. And he fell on his knees before David and said, Oh, please forgive me, David. Don't kill me. And David's right-hand man said, Let me cut his head off, David. And David said, No. I'm going to forgive him. Now that man eventually got it. 
He eventually got killed because he never changed his ways. He never recognized that he needed to repent. He stayed in that self-image that it's about me. God created you and I in the image of God the Father. He sent God the Son to come and die a horrendous death so that you and I might walk as He walked, talk as He talked. God is about bringing restoration to the body of Christ. He wants to bring us back so He can use us in the end time harvest. He said the fields are white for harvest. But where are the laborers? Where are the laborers? Where are those that I can send out into the harvest? I don't know about you, but I'm going to cry, send me, Lord, send me. I want to go, Father, I want to go. I want to speak what you want me to speak, Father. I want to go where you want me to go, Father. Father, I want to represent your heart. I want to represent you. Forgive me, Father, for not doing it in so many cases. Forgive me for this humanity I live in and I allow it at times to take control. Father, I want to walk as you walked. I want to talk as you talk. God is restoring the tabernacle of David. That tabernacle of David is up on Mount Zion. It represented God's presence. It represented God's power, His, His uh, being. Zion represents all of God's sons and daughters. It represents the church. I've got a friend that says he believes that he's a Jew because he was grafted in, and I believe the same way he does. I believe God's got his, the Jews and he's got the, the, the Gentiles, but he said he put them together and he made them one. He said, I'm going to take away the division that was between them. And I'm going to bring and make me a one new man. And that one new man is going to be about my business. And they're going to do what the Father tells them to do. Because they're going to be led by His Spirit. Let me read you out of Mark chapter 7 and I'll close. Before I go there, Hebrews 12, 27, 28 said, yet once, yet once more indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken. And everything that can be shaken will be shaken. That what cannot be shaken may remain. The kingdom of God is which cannot be shaken. In Mark chapter 7, I guess y'all know I haven't even got to my notes. God is good, y'all. All the time. I have been so excited since December because I believe that God told me things that He was been telling me for 30 years and showing me things that He said you're about to experience them. I had demons scream out in the meetings I had in the early years when I said, I want to experience all you got, Father. I want your glory to come down just like it did in the temple when Solomon dedicated it. And I had demons scream out and saying, you can't handle the glory of God. Praise God when the demons scream out that I'm going to experience it. Because I'm going to see God's sons and daughters walk in the power of the Holy Ghost. They're going to walk as Jesus walked, talk as Jesus talked. They're not going to just be attendees. They're going to be doers of the Word. Where did I tell you all to go? <laughs> Mark, please turn to Mark chapter 7. This is good stuff, y'all. I'm having fun. <laughs> Mark chapter 7. Then the Pharisees and some of the scribes came together to him, having come from Jerusalem. Now, when they saw some of his disciples eat bread and defile with defile, that is, with unwashed hands, they found fault. 
For the Pharisees and all the Jews did not eat unless they washed their hands in a special way, holding the tradition of the elders. Why then? Why? They came from the marketplace. They do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other things which they have received and hold, like the washing of cups, pitchers, copper vessels, and couches. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? Jesus answered them and said to them, Well, did Isaiah prophesy, or did Isaiah prophesy to you hypocrites? As it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandments of God, you hold the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers and cups and many other such things you do. He said to them, all too well, you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and he who curses father and mother, let him be put to death. But you say, if a man says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is Corban, that is, a gift of God, then you no longer let him do anything for his father and his mother, making the word of God of no effect through your tradition which you have handed down. And many such things you do. What things have we done? We formed a tradition here at Christian Missions of being non-traditional. We became as, much, as traditional as anybody in the country. When he had called all the multitudes to himself, he said to them, Hear me, everyone, and understand, there is nothing that enters a man from outside which can defile him. But the things which come out of him, those are the things that defile a man. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. I want to hear what the Father has to say. What about you? When he had entered a house away from the crowd, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. So he said to them, Are you thus without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from the outside cannot defile him? Because it not, does not enter his heart, but his stomach, and is eliminated, thus purifying all foods. And he said, What comes out of the man that defiles a man for from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. Sadie and I were having a heart-to-heart -heart conversation one night and I was repenting to her for something I'd said, something I did and, and I said, please forgive me, Sadie, I'm so sorry. But you know it wasn't in my heart to do that, to hurt you. I would never hurt you. And I heard that still, small voice and it wasn't so still, y'all. I heard a booming voice that said, you're a liar! Because see, I've cried since I was a little boy. And I said, Lord, I want to have ears to hear what your spirit has to say. And I stopped me in my tracks and I said, Lord, what do you mean I'm a liar? And he said, out of the heart proceed evil desires. And I went, whoops. Father, this was in my heart. Sadie, I'm sorry. I wasn't really repenting. I was saying and acting like King Saul. It's not me. It's those people. You know, it, it wasn't in my heart, so it's a, you know, I'm not really re needing to repent because I didn't mean it, so it's okay. True heartfelt repentance is the acknowledgement and a turning and walking completely away the opposite direction. It's not just continuing to do the same thing. If we're going to have times of refreshing, if we're going to have times of restoration, if we're going to have times of reconciliation, the first thing there's got to be is repentance. Before the repentance, you've got to recognize it was in your heart to do it. And you did it because you have a self-image instead of the image that God created you for. He said, I created my sons and daughters. In my image, I created them male and female. I have the image of the Father. You have the image of the Father. And so therefore... 
it's very unbecoming of a son and daughter of the Most High God to not repent. All of you have a little cup in your hands or in your seat. If you hadn't already tore them up, I've got some somewhere. If y'all grab them cups, we're going to take communion together. All y'all at home, please, please take communion with us and we'll give you a moment to grab your juice or your crackers or whatever you got. You know, we, we had to form a tradition that's different than what we had. We used to do unleavened bread because, you know, that, that represented we're, we're not allowing the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees to attack us. We're going to allow all of this to, to go away. And so as we come to take this time, where's my lovely bride? Come open, mine, lady. If y'all need help, I got one. Michael, I'm open. Not the lovely bride, but That's all right. Well, you're, you're a lovely bride. You're the bride of Christ. Okay. You know, whenever we take communion, we're supposed to do this in remembrance of Christ and, and Him crucified. We're supposed to do it for what He, what he did for you and I. And, and so as we take this, uh, I call them styrofoam wafers. Uh, as we stake this, whatever it is, it represents Christ's body that was given for you and I. Michael, will you open Sadie? She can't get hers open either. I told you all a few weeks ago there was a song called The Heart, Heart of Worship. It was written years ago, and in that song, the heart of worship, it says, forgive us for what we have made it. Because we made it about ourselves. We've got to return back to the covenant of God. We've got to allow Him to restore that covenant that He is our God, and we are His sons and daughters. That we are to walk worthy of Him in everything that we say and do. That we have the image of God dwelling within us because we have been given the Spirit of promise, the Holy Spirit. And he said that the Holy Spirit would guide us into all truth. And so you need to ask the Lord, Father, what is hidden within me? What are things that I continue to rep repetitiously do that I'm not repenting of? Well, some of the things that, that he talked about in Amos 5, he said, uh, you know, you've got some ritualistic worship. You know, you sing these songs, and, and, uh, but they're just words that you're just mouthing. You haven't examined the words of what it means, and you've got to sing from your heart. It can't be just lip devotion. It's got to be heart devotion. See, the sign of the covenant was circumcision. Well, see, we don't have to, to do the circumcision now because it's about the heart. It's about allowing God to circumcise the heart, to cut away all of the hard-heartedness and allow Him to create in us a new heart. King David cried out in Psalms 51, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Create in me a clean heart. Father, we ask that as we take this bread, that you create in each and every one of us that clean heart. Father, you said there is no guilt. There is no condemnation. You said that when we repent, there is times of refreshing that come. So, Father, we repent today because, Father, I believe that you have sent people in our way. You have sent people to us to help us recognize some things in our lives. And, Father, we have rejected them and so, therefore, we have rejected your Holy Spirit. Father, we recognize that there are things that are not pleasing you. And we choose to lay them down right now, Father. We choose to lay them down at the foot of the cross. And when we leave this place, we're not going to take it up again. Jesus, thank you for your physical body that was shed for us. Father, we thank you that your blood was shed for us. That you brought about what you called a remission of sins. You brought about a redemption that you bought and paid for each and every one of us with your blood. And so we acknowledge that blood, this blood cleanses us. It purifies us. It restores us. And so, Father, we take this juice representing that blood that was shed for the remission of all our sins past, present, and future. Father, you said that if we would acknowledge before you, Father, then you would cleanse us from all unrighteousness, and then we could have that intimate fellowship, Father, with you 
and we could be conformed to the image of Jesus. Father, you said that that was your perfect will. It's your perfect will to conform each and every one of us to the image of your Son here and to now. It's not about when we get there with you, but it's about to now. So Lord, we receive this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay? Repentance brings about a time of refreshing. And now we want to sing the song that is our theme song for this year. And as we sing this theme song, if you're here in the uh, worship center today with us, or if you're sitting by your computer, your iPhone, whatever you're sitting by, you listen to the radio, pull over the side of the road and, and, and just acknowledge Send me, Father. Send me. I'm willing to go. I'm willing to do, Father. I repent. I repent, Father. So now bring about that reconciliation in relationships, in health, in wholeness, Father. Totally, spirit, soul, and body. Bring about, Father, that restoration to where marriages are better than they ever was before. Father, that those relationships are more and above anything they can imagine. Restoration, Father. You said that when the thieves caught, he must return sevenfold. So we claim a sevenfold return on all the enemies tried to steal in and through this pandemic, this terroristic attack from the pits of hell. We choose to submit to you, Father. We choose to agree with you. We choose to rejoice. And your word says when the thief is caught, he must return. So, Father, we catch the thief because he has tried to destroy your sons and daughters. He's tried to destroy your nation that you formed for your sons of your daughters. Father, we pray for that peace in Jerusalem. And you said that each and every one of your sons and daughters that play, pray for your peace in Jerusalem, they would be blessed because they are walking in your image with your purposes, with your intentions, Father. Come, Lord Jesus. Come in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for watching this week's message. If you would like to partner with us financially or support our ministry, it's now easier than ever. When you give to Christian missions, you are sowing in people's lives and advancing the kingdom. Try giving online today by visiting cmjacksboro.com slash give.